Thank you all for being here. How many were with me uh, back in the spring for Wicked Hot Decisions? Cool, cool. Um, I'm glad you all came back. Uh, by background, I started at Electronic Arts building bang bang shoot 'em up games, kind of rotting people's brains out. And then I went to the good side. I, I built a company. Uh, my first hit product was Elmo, Elmo's Preschool. Um, but I built kids' educational software, and then from the from look at high decisions, uh, I talked about Netflix. Uh, so that's how many of you are Netflix members today? Okay, thank you for supporting my daughter's medical school bills. <laughs> uh, and then how many of you have heard of Chegg? Chegg is a textbook rental company. Okay, so that that's the that was doing good for the world. So today, students are saving about 500 million bucks doing that. You sort of hear a theme going from dark to to white side in my career. I'll reflect on that a little bit. Okay, I want to tell you about my summer. So, my summer, my wife got invited to an executive education program, like an MBA for people in, in Virginia, and they asked me to talk there. And I, I, I never finished my talk on time. And while I was at, at the end sort of answering questions, this gymnast rolled one of these things out, okay? Now, if you were in high school, this is a, and a boy, this is a, uh, the, the horse is a substantial um, object of dread. So this guy brings this thing out, and now I, I, I finally made it off the stage, and then he's all mic'd up, and he's wired, and he hops on, and he begins to do a presentation. Are there any gymnasts in the room? Okay. Um, can you perform for me? <laughs> so he's up on the horse and he's whirling and juring. Those are technical terms, correct? Uh, and, and, and he talks about what it is to get a perfect 10. So I'm going to use the old system because I know it. He says, I get 9.4 points out of 10 just for getting on the horse and doing my job. And then he proceeds to do these wild ass, he did a double sow cow. Lots of agility, which is again a technical gymnastics term. And I get the next three tenths of a point for taking, embracing creativity and risk in my job. And then, I, I, I'd usually do it for you, but they couldn't bring my horse today. And, and he proceeded to stretch, and, and on his fingertips, he's doing this handstand, and his toes are going up to the moon. And he says, I get the last three tenths, bringing me to a perfect ten for extension. And I said to myself, oh my god, what an amazing metaphor for doing the job of a product manager. So what I'm going to do is talk about getting on the pommel, what it is to do your job. I'm going to describe the skills that you need in order to be a highly effective product manager or product leader. And then I'm going to talk about embracing creativity and risk in your, your career. And I call that career hacking. And I'll show it a bit to, to the lens of my career. And then this last idea is how you can get extension in your career through something that I call personal board of directors. So I'm going to talk for a minute about what the job is of a product manager. So my definition is you love to build stuff. You love to build things. And the job is to delight customers in margin enhancing hard to copy ways. How many of you are delighted with Netflix? Okay. And the margin enhancing is just how do you make a business out of it? Some of you are paying your 10 or 11 bucks and the others are using someone else's account and that's okay. okay? <laughs> and then the hard to copy ways in product management is think about if you were doing a startup today, why it would be so hard to copy Netflix? You don't have the brand, you don't have the huge economy of scale where you can't afford to invest 300 million in original content. Um, so this is the way I think about the job. And so what I'm going to do is talk about some of the skills that, that enable you to do that. So I've brought up an iconic product leader. What are this dude's skills? He's highly creative. What else? Visionary. Perceptive. Perceptive? Yes. Consumer insight, yes. Determined. Determined, grit, persistent. persistent, nitpicky, is that what you said? Cool, okay. What about the reality distortion field? Yeah, go. Yin-yang, you know, product is a supported market. 
oh my God, bringing together product peeps and marketing peeps, the packaging and positioning and how to describe the product in a way that appeals to you, and actually building the product that delivers on that. It's amazing. All right, there's a lot of different product leaders out there. This is April, under which she happens to be the product leader for Slack. The way I think about the range of skills that, that folks have, and by the way, um, the, the, the skills of different product leaders are, are radically different. Uh, and I'll reveal myself in a bit. But I break the world into sort of two sides of the ledger here. So uh, on the left side, I call these product management skills. These are the technical skills of a product manager. And I'll talk a little bit more about those skills. But for perspective, uh, if you ask April you know, what she's wicked good at, she'll say she's high on the technical skills. She's high on the business skills, and she, she's high on the design skills. That's her. And then the right side of the ledger, uh, as you grow up and you become a muckety muck, a VP, a, a leader in an organization, there's a different set of skills that you need to evolve over time. So when I'm interviewing candidates for a management team, whether they're in marketing or finance or the product leader or a sales function, the stuff over on the leadership skills, the functional leadership skills, those are the things that I look for in every leader, irrespective of a function. What's different from one area to the next is those technical skills. And what I, I want you thinking about a couple of things. What are my skills? I mean, you. The second is, what skills are missing from either of these lists? That, that's what I want you thinking about. And, and now I'm going to share a little bit more. So I'm going to dig slightly deeper into the technical skills of a product manager. Jeff Bezos happens to be wicked strong on the management and the business skills. Uh, how many of you own an Alexa today? Okay, that's why it's so cool. Um, so I'm just gonna give you little tidbits for each of these skills. So the technical skills of a product manager, it simply means you work well with engineers. Uh, a lot of folks today graduate as majors in computer science. I didn't, I was an English major, so I'm light, technically. But I work highly effectively with engineers. On the management, for, for product manager, the, the real question for me is, can you deliver results? Can you build stuff? Do you have exceptional communication skills that help, help everybody to work together? Creativity is the lifeblood of our work. So one hopes that you have ideas that eventually will, will, will change the world. Business. Can you build a product that gets money back from consumers so you can invest more in it to make it better and better and better and better and better? Marketing, uh, it was you that brought up the idea that Steve Jobs is highly effective at packaging and positioning ideas and then building a product against that. Uh, I happen to think that's an important skill. Design, that's super challenging when we were required to figure out how to create a simple experience that everybody could use on this little imaginary iPhone in my hand. It's an imaginary iPhone 10. Okay? It's really nice. Um, but, the, but the design challenge is substantial. And the last skill here that I focus on, I call it consumer insight. It's that empathy that you were talking about. But various sources, qualitative focus groups, survey, asking people what they think, digging in the dirt for trends in the data. But the big dog in the last 10 years has been A-B testing. Um, how many of you uh, have engaged in A-B tests in the last couple of years? Okay. So that's really understanding um, how can you change customers' behavior. Uh, Netflix, if you're a Netflix member, there are hundreds of A-B tests that are going on right now that you're not aware of. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the other side of the, the ledger. Elon Musk, can he do the inspired communication of a vision as a leader? Like, his, the end goal for him is that we're gonna Recolonize humans on Mars. Is that big? <laughs> and he's even got a plan, step by step along the way, how that's going to happen. But, so my simple definition of leadership is inspired communication of a vision. Now you'll notice before I, I talked about management, about building stuff, as we all grow up as leaders, the management changes. It's can you build great teams? And I call that the hiring, firing, and developing. The strategic thinking is answering the questions, how can you delight customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways? I look for a mix of two things, and they're diametrically opposed. I look for people that are really results oriented, I call that everybody grab a shovel. But on the other side, 
they're keenly aware of the cultural issues, the softer issues. And I love culture because it's one of the ways that people can make decisions without any process or even any communication, which is, makes it wonderfully powerful. Business maturity, the business maturity has nothing to do with age. So Mark Zuckerberg has uncommon business maturity. He's made great decisions about the business, about the product, and about the people. And now he's probably a whopping 32 years old. Uh, and, but, so I look for business maturity in these leaders. You know, I have an advantage. I, because I'm older, I've made more mistakes than all of you in the room. And I, I can simply learn from them and, and try not to re replicate the same mistake. Domain expertise, you can tell I, I have expertise in two areas, uh, education and entertainment. That's what I'm about. All right, so I'm going to reveal myself. So if you think about uh, the, the style of, of, of product leader that I am, I'm strong on the management, the processes to, to deliver results. I think hard about delivering a successful business. And I used to be in marketing. And I switched over on the product because I really love building stuff. And then on the other side, I, I spent a lot of time on the, the inspired communication of a vision of building great teams. And I think a lot about what's the strategy that, in the case of Netflix, would, would let Netflix go from zero million members to 100 million members today. So this is my style. Does anybody want to reveal themselves? On the left side, the idea is pick two of those things that, that, that describe you as a product manager. I'm looking for volunteers. And I'm a relentless cold caller, but I love you. Thank you. What are you? Good. OK, so he's technical, he's creative, and maybe throw a design in there. So we'll give it to you, OK? Do you want to try the other side of the ledger? We got strategy and the management. I'm sure you're all looking at this, and you're all radically different styles, if you if you will. Anybody here great on all all of these on both sides of the ledger? Oh, please speak up now. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the couple of things I've learned. Uh, I think of these as you know, what what are your superpowers? And uh, I, can, I can reveal myself. I, um, I suck at some of the things on this list, okay? Um, but I tend to focus on the two or three on each side that, that help to differentiate me and pair me well with certain opportunities. Uh, I'll give you a sense of what I suck at. Uh, I'm not results-oriented enough for working in a young startup with an incredibly proactive results-oriented CEO. We get along like oil and water. You know, I say things like, why should I do that? And, and the CEO will say, do it now. <laughs> uh, I'd rather be skiing right now, thank you. Okay? Uh, it's just not me. And, and I learned over time that I'm really not a starter. I, I joined companies a little bit later than that, that awkward moment of six people in the building. What's missing from my list? Think about skills that you perceive are important for, for a product leader on either side of the equation. I've done it perfectly? Yes, Brandon. There's some soft skills in there. What, so give me some examples. Being personable, being able to relate, being able to just get along and have a conversation, not be too awkward with you. Yeah, so he's bringing up the soft skills. A lot of the soft skills hang in this cultural area for me. They also hang in the management. So your ability to empathize with people that you work with, your ability to communicate effectively with them. It's the way I think about some of that stuff. What else do you think might be missing from the ledger here? By the way, this has changed over 10 and 15 years for me. Each time I've hired a product manager, if I had a product manager who was exceptional in some regard, I was asking myself, okay, what are the unique skills of that person? Um, and then, um, in other cases, I'll, I'll hire someone that Help me. <laughs> I think it's okay. Oh, oh. Just don't move. Don't move. Yeah. Don't speak. Go for it. 
Hello? 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 It's working? Oh. Hey, pay no attention. Put that on the video. <laughs> um, the list was developed over years of, think about this sort of A-B testing. An employee's great. Did I pick up their special skills? An employee stunk. You know, did I fail to, to meter them on some particular thing? Uh, so I, I, the main thing here is think about your specific skills. Focus more attention on developing those superpowers and less on, on fixing your, your obvious faults. I, I'm never going to learn finance, for instance. All right. So the good news here is you don't have to develop all these skills tomorrow. So I'm going to show you how they play out of time. So I talked about how uh, product leaders, they love to build stuff. So the, the first part of the career is you build something. And next, you figure out how to build something successful. And then you start building an organization. And then you build a company. And there's actually something bigger than building a company. Anybody want to guess what it is? Building culture. I call it building an industry. Okay? Today, you're all streaming. You're part of a new industry called internet TV. That's way cool. Okay, so this is the first something that I ever built. It's called Sesame Street Counting Cafe. It's on the Sega Genesis. Okay. It only cost me $300,000 to build, and 300 kids liked it. It was something. But I learned how to work with engineers and designers and music people. My first hit was called Almost Preschool. It was the year that Oprah Win Winfrey threw Tickle Me Elmo's out onto the, into the audience. And, and Elmo all of a sudden became a big hit. And I'm like, thank you, Oprah. Okay? <laughs> but the other idea here was I learned how to package and position stuff. As a parent, would you like for only 30 bucks to have a full preschool curriculum for your child with Elmo? Of course. Okay? That was the reason it was the hit. Over time, I started building software with lots of different brands. And I realized that my job was now to build a team that could do those things. I couldn't do all the work myself. And then these are all companies that I've had a hand in building. And then the industry, how many of you have, have already finished Stranger Things 2? Oh my god, what are you guys doing? <laughs> I had to swap out Kevin Spacey this morning. <laughs> that used to be the archetypal example. All right, so in terms of the examples here, um, the building something, basic design and management, the hit, talk about the marketing skills and the consumer insight, really knowing what would resonate with parents. And then as I was building an organization, then I was learning the leadership, the strategy, the hiring. I was beginning to learn the importance of culture. That once there were 120 people in the, in the room, people could just make good decisions about what was right or wrong because they understood the culture of the company. Once you become a VP of product of Muckety Muck, uh, Cross-functional leadership. How well do you work effectively with your finance partner or with your sales partner? And that's how I think about cross-functional leadership. And you start engaging in what's the right company strategy, not just the product. And then industry, uh, it's a lot about long-term strategy and partnership. So that the key insight for Netflix was how do you make it so that all of you can watch whatever you want, whenever you want, on any television or device that you buy. So think about the long-term play to get partners from Samsung or Xbox or from LG, any device that you buy today. And so these are the skills that, that you, you learn eventually. So Chris, the main thing I want you thinking about in your product leader career is what are my superpowers? You know, what are the skills from the, the left side of the ledger, those PM skills, and what are the skills I need to develop as I slowly become a muckety muck, a, a leader in my company. So that's the, the key insight here. So now I'm going to move on to the second chapter. So embracing creativity and risk in your career. The hacking, if you will. I've learned some things about me. So I have been thrown off the tracks. I've been hired, I've been fired, I've run out of money in my startup, and, and so I've learned over time, I, I'm not that great at just staying on the same tracks, and, and that risk-taking, that being thrown off and discovering how to back, get on the tracks has been helpful for me. Something that I've learned about careers 
is we all think of them as a fairly linear path, like a steps on the ladder, and it's not. I mean, I think this is the Silk Road. It, LinkedIn has all the data for all of us. And then they published something that I thought was really interesting. They said that the road that people go through their career to become CEO is a winding <laughs> path. They spend some time in marketing, and then in sales, and then they might be over in product, and then they, they, they might be back to product or, or to sales. And in all of this, they're picking up those cross-functional skills. Uh, and so the point here is that these careers, they're often not linear. And so the, the, the fact that I was thrown off the tracks, et cetera, helped me to develop these different skills. I love Google. If you ask Google for a photo of a fork in the road, this is what you get. Okay? Um, but my point is that uh, I, I was not smart about this in any way in my 20s. But looking back, there were a number of career hypotheses for me. And what I want you thinking about are what are hypotheses in my career today. So there was a big question. Was I going to be a marketing dude versus a, a product dude? Was I enamored of starting companies from scratch or joining a little bit later and being a builder? Was I introduced, focused on being a consumer or did I want to do enterprise? Did I want to do entertainment or did I want to do education? Now I wish I had been conscious about these choices early in my career, but I wasn't. So I'm going to show you a little how it played out. My first startup was a sailing school. And it was in San Francisco. And the lucky part is I found San Francisco, which is a great place to have high-tech careers. Uh, and this was my first professional job. This is in a mail room at McCann Erickson in, in San Francisco. This is how I began my marketing career. I was very good at it. Okay? My wife met me. She thought I was like the computer guy. And like, after she married me, she realized, wait, wait, you actually pushed a mail cart? Okay? Uh, this is how it started. Um, I have a pal, Michael's in the audience. I, I, I went to business school at a place where I could ski. And I did this for you, Michael. This is me and my wife, Kristen. We did get married. Um, but a good thing that I did at my second year of business school was instead of going to sleep at 2 in the morning, I would start building prototypes for kids' games using HyperCard. Does anybody in the room know what HyperCard is? Oh, thank you. It's awesome. Um, so at 2 in the morning, I was so enamored of what would it be to build a kid's educational software game that I was doing it. And I was free riding on the rest of my, my case team. Um, okay, and then I joined Electronic Arts and Marketing. But then I'm like, wow, I'd really love to build stuff. And I switched over. And then I talked about the kids' products. Anybody recognize this dude? This is Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. Um, and so I uh, sold a company to him and then helped grow uh, a, a bunch of kids and entertainment software that was part of Mattel. All right, look carefully at this graphic. Let me give you a clue. Anytime you see pixelated art like you do with Family Wonder, you know the company died. Right? Uh, so this is Family Wonder was a startup, it was e-commerce. If you're looking for something fun to do with your kids or to buy, you'd go to Family Wonder, and it didn't work. Okay. Uh, and so this is the little. Um, trick in careers, there's a, there's a fair amount of success and there's a lot of failure and how well do you learn from it. So this is my LinkedIn profile. It's carefully papered over a period from 2001 to almost 2005. Look at the thing in the middle as a consultant, how little I did, okay? This was a period of failure, right? This was the internet blender in San Francisco. Everybody was losing their jobs left and right, okay? So my point is uh, certainly not linear for me, but I was learning a ton from these many mistakes. This was a neuroperformance software startup. It would help folks with dyslexia. Do you think it worked? <laughs> it did not. Okay. Uh, and then you know I got my mojo back. So uh, this is what Netflix looks like today. Um, this is interesting. I joined Chegg because uh, I wanted again I wanted to help kids. You know, education saved money. It's big. Uh, and I actually wanted to help take a company public, and I pulled that off. That's me on the left. My daughter still gave me grief because I never, never bought a suit. Okay? Um, but newsflash, this was a, a, an unhappy period of my life. I found myself sort of banging my head against the wall, trying to, waiting for the, the industry to go from textbooks by mail to e-textbooks. And that transition was wicked slow. 
found it incredibly frustrating. All right, so now you look back on the hypotheses. So again, I wasn't this smart. I, you know, I didn't know how to think about it in my 20s, but I, I wish that I had been thoughtful about the hypotheses. But this is what I learned. I'm a product person. I'm not great at the inception of startup. I love to join a startup with proof of concept that's ready to scale, and then I help it to build. And then I, I love consumer. And then the answer in entertainment and education was both. And that's possible. So, and then I, my last three years, I have been career hacking. Uh, I work three days a week for different companies while they're trying to find the five day version of me. It's been incredibly fun. Uh, and it's like, you know, it gives me the flexibility to do stuff like this or, or ski last year, which was awesome. Okay? So I was thoughtful three years ago about these different hypotheses. I said, do I want to be a product leader or do I want to be a CEO? And I concluded that I didn't want to be a CEO. I'll, I'll show you how I learned that. Do I want to work full time or part time? Do I want to be a teacher? Well, this is a bizarre. Do I want to be a venture capitalist? Those are like not the same. Okay? And then do I want to be on a board or I want to be an advisor? And through a series of experiments, this is where I arrived on all of these things. It was great fun. Uh, so I wish that I had been as thoughtful you know, 30 years ago as, as I learned to be in the last couple of years. So here's the question in career hacking. In, in, in your own career, how do you measure success? How do you know if you're successful or not? That's the big idea with hacking, which is what's the right metric? What are some ideas about how to measure if your career is successful or not? Money. Money, 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 money. What else? Satisfaction or happiness. Satisfaction. Job satisfaction. Happiness. What else? Impact on the world. Did you have something else? You're learning. You're learning. What else? Toys in the garage. What, what? Toys in the garage. Toys in the garage. That's better than money. I totally agree with you. I've got toys in Fergie's garage. That's where I keep them. <laughs> like your, your mountain bike's lonely, Gib. Okay, uh, these are all great ideas, so I graphed it. Okay, so this is what income looks like. Um, Newsflash: uh, you don't make a lot as a sailing instructor, and you certainly don't make a lot in a in a mail room. Okay, and this is school; you make nothing the opposite. Um, but you can see it's largely kind of up and to the right. Remember that 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 period of failure? You know, that's like the Grand Canyon here, right? This, this was like not good from an income point of view. Job sap. So ask yourself right now, on a scale of zero to ten, where zero sucks and ten is often uh, awesome, what's my current job satisfaction? I want you to have a number in your head. Michael, do you want to share yours? Nine. Nine. It's amazing. Anybody else want to share their number? Seven. Seven. Y'all have a number in your head? I'm sure there's a few that have fives in their head, right? Or less, okay? The fives <coughs> and the less, you want to be thinking about how you can change your current job, whatever you can do. And usually, if, it's, if you're kind of miserable for more than six months, there, there's some change that you need. Okay, so look at mine. It looks like a dolphin. No. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I think it does reflect a little bit. I love new jobs and I love going up the learning curve. And then I'm not learning as much and then I have to go on to the, the, the next thing. I also think it has to do with uh, the fact that I love helping to scale companies, but at some point if they're way too big, then I, I have to move on to the next. But this is a graph. And remember that moment at Chev where I was helping to take the company public? That was how I felt, right? So this is job satisfaction, and then good for the world. So uh, to know my household, my, my wife's in biotech, she's trying to cure cancer, okay? So I'm building bang bang shoot 'em up games of electronic arts, and she's like, kid, you're rotting out people's brains. This is not a good use of your time, okay? Which took me back to education. And then my wife, she's really troublesome to me. <laughs> Do you think binge watching is good for humanity? Okay. But helping students to save hundreds of millions of dollars renting textbooks instead of buying is a good thing. I wish I could do a regression and give you one metric on how to blend these things together. The thing that I have found to be the most helpful is this idea of your job satisfaction in the moment. 
So you know, my, my main tip is work to make sure at any moment in time that your current job satisfaction is at least an eight or above. If it's down at five or so for at least six months, now you, you got some thinking to do. So in the career hacking, this is the stuff that I have learned. Um, you know, the first note is to be bold, to take on risk like the gymnast did. Be strategic. So I have career conversations with product managers and they're kind of moving around and really haven't progressed very much. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? And they look at me and they say, you know, part of my job is to be strategic, but I haven't been strategic in thinking about my own career. I'm like, ah. You, you got it. Form these various hypotheses about what you think will give you that, that long-term career satisfaction. You saw it with me. You know, it took me a while to understand that, that I'm not much of a starter out of the box, but I love to build stuff. And then this insight that once the company's got like 3,000 people, shoot me. It's just the wrong environment for me. Experiment. So uh, the two in the morning thing at talk, I was prototyping. I was experimenting with different avenues in my career. Most of you have six or eight hours in a week where you could engage in, in trying different stuff or talking to people in industries or companies that you're excited about. I mean, me doing talks began as an experiment. Like, I'm gonna just do talks and see what happens. Okay? And maybe I'll get a free lunch. That's awesome, thank you so much. Um, the passionate part, most of the good stuff is, like, if you find yourself intellectually curious about something, chase that. Uh, and that, that leads you to a place where you get so engaged and so interested that you start determining what everybody's looking for, which is grit and persistence in your role. All right, so I said be bold. So I, I, I just I stopped myself for a second and I said, okay, what helps people to be bold? So uh, education is good. So we, we all go to school and grad school and what, whatever, but we can always be learning in what we do. And, and the more education, it usually enables a lot more risk taking. Uh, and the other thing that, uh, like I have a startup pal, uh, he's very successful. Um, he was about ready to buy a house on Sand Hill Road, which is expensive. Like, why would you want to do that? Why don't you keep the simple life that you have today so you can fundamentally take on more risk? as an entrepreneur and not worry about paying the damn mortgage. Um, and then job hunting skills. So I have done lots of job hunting and I've learned to be pretty good at it. So I, I start with uh, what are the 10 companies that I'm really interested in? What are the patterns that are hiding in there? You know, the, the, the themes that say about me and my career. And then I, if, I'm, if I'm unemployed, then I spend, you know, it's an optimization problem for me, which is, okay, what are all the phone calls and emails I have to write or Slack? I'm, I'm a cool kid now, damn it. Um, to set up two conversations a day with recruiters, with VCs, with entrepreneurs, with friends at companies that I really admire. Uh, and then if I'm able to operate at that pace, I usually find something that's really exciting to me. And that's happened to me a number of times in my career. I think that's Salt Lake. Okay? These kids on Salt Lake, was a, it was an extravagant photo shoot. Um, anyways, I was reflecting, I, I say something quite often to folks, I work with lots of teams and, and I'm an advisor and I've been in companies and one of the things that they call it a gibbism, I say, okay, treat me like I'm stupid, okay? So in my career, I've, I've really been good at that early stage sucking at stuff, okay? Because I've sort of embraced that beginner's mind. And then if there was somebody had an insight back there, I have learned after five years or so, I, I'm ready for that next learning curve where I can suck at the next thing and then walk up it. So now I want to talk about extending your career. How many of you have a personal board of directors for your career today? Cool. How many peeps? Four. Four. Are they good? What kind of people are they? Mentors. And Do they care about coach, you? They yeah, that sounds great. Is it helpful? Okay, so I'm going to share share mine. So this is these are some of my board of directors. There's a lot of them. Uh, there you go, Mike Tonneson, Langley Steiner's in the middle. He's another B school pal. Just took his company public. What's it called? Car Gurus. 
Yeah. Play along, Mike. Make lucky like me. <laughs> um, I've made a lot of choices about which company to work for or not. And another newsflash, I sort of hinted at this already. I, financially, I'm not a student anyway. But one of my board members is a freaking machine as a financier. Like, he's saying, should we spend, should we invest 30 to 50 million in this company? I go to him to get insight, should I join this startup or not, because I'm investing time. But this is the benefit of having other folks to speak with. So I'm gonna give you some advice that, that has incredibly been very helpful to me. Greg Bestick is a very, uh, this is the only photo I could find of him on the internet. Okay? He's right here. He was my boss at Creative Wonders. He said, Gib, I'm a good CEO, I'm good at raising money, and I'm not gonna be helpful in your career as a product leader. Tell where I was just learning stuff. Get out there and build your community of peers. They're all going through the same issues as you at the same moment in time. Incredibly helpful insight for me that, that helped extend things. This is Ron Hogue. He's probably 20 years ahead of me at, at Little Amherst College. Uh, he listened to me. He said, Gib, you've always talked about building an industry, but you always start at the beginning of a company, like in the early days. And by the way, building an industry takes like 20 years. He said, why don't you go out there and find a good company that fundamentally understands how to build consumer and shareholder value and help make it great. And that was the insight that landed me at the door at the Netflix when there were like 130 people when I joined, which felt big for the early stage. Incredible insight. Irv Grossbeck, he's the uh, buck a year. He invented the cable TV industry. Okay? And I've gotten to know him over the years, and he said, hey, Gib, can I tell you something you may not like? I'm like bracing myself. You're too nice to be a startup CEO. And that resonated with me. And now, I know there are some nice startup CEOs. I, I know this to be true, so if you're one of them in the audience, I'm not calling all of you jerks. Um, but this resonated with me. And he saved me like five or 10 years. I thought the next thing after being a product leader, of course I would be the CEO next. But with this one piece of advice, he gave me the license not to do it, which was incredibly helpful. This is Patty McCord. She runs uh, People uh, HR at Netflix. She's incredibly candid. I was walking on the beach, this is like three years ago. I'm like, hey Patty, I can't, I'm having a hard time finding a non-traditional career. And she's like, give. Yeah. Just tell people what you want. And so the recruiter would call, say, Give, we want you to be the, the, the head of product for Dante Don. I said, I'll do it as long as it's three days a week. And then they started saying yes. Incredibly helpful advice. Okay, this is my shark pal. Um, this is Barry McCarthy, he's now the CFO at Spotify. I was looking around for different companies to advise, maybe to join. And this is a little like that moment of, I got one word for you, Gib, plastics. Okay? But he said, FinTech. And the, it was an incredible insight about a very rich area of startup life today in the San Francisco Bay Area. So one of my first three day a week roles is, a, is at a FinTech company called NerdWallet. Incredibly helpful. Joel Jewett, he's the dude on the right. Joel retired at age 40. And Joel would take his kids to school in the morning, and then he'd come work out, pick up his kids at school, and then he'd go into the back of his garage, who was a drummer, and he'd drum. And after about six months, his family did an intervention with him and said, you have to go work, work back to work, Dad. You're driving us freaking crazy, okay? And so it was Joel who said to me, hey, Gib, um, you need to think about how to fulfill both your social needs and your purpose. And, and this was the insight. My purpose is largely about teaching, coaching, mentoring. The social needs are not only part of a team on, on a three-day-a-week basis. Incredibly helpful advice from one of my board members. So the idea of this personal board of directors, a um, couple of tips and tricks. It's really annoying when people only come to you when all heck is breaking loose. So all of these people I invest time and energy, I check in with them every three, six, nine months. So I have an ongoing relationship in good times and bad. And then they are available when it's bad. You can tell, candor. So a lot of the, these folks for me, they're incredibly candid with me. 
Uh, and then you, I'm playing back stories that I can remember 5, 10, 15 years ago, listening carefully. And then the refresh off and uh, at different stages in your career, you need different kinds of peers and mentors as you take on different experiments. A couple of notes on the peers versus mentors. I'm sort of an animal on LinkedIn. So, you know, every company I work with, uh, I'm connected with all of them, and that's one of the ways I keep up with my peers over time. But then it's the simple email, hey, I want to let you know that I'm in Salt Lake City, it'd be great to have breakfast or lunch. Um, but all these folks, they tend to be product leaders for me, they tend to be in consumer tech, they tend to be at companies with 100 to 1,000 people, uh, and, and they're incredibly helpful. On the mentor side, what I look for is extraordinary <coughs> judgment. So I brought up Barry, the fintech dude. He's just incredibly shrewd about what companies to invest time in or not. And I look for a broad set of skills beyond just product management. And I, these need to be people that I trust as I'm revealing my deep, dark secrets to them. Okay? And there's always this combination of candid and caring. So, I know there's some folks out there that got uncomfortable when I asked them what number they were at. Okay? So what I'm hoping that you'll start thinking about more today in a very conscious way is what are my superpowers? What are the theories and hypotheses that I have about the future of my career? What are those side projects or experiments I can engage in to begin to test drive these ideas to, to get me from the five I'm at today to the eight or nine that I need or want to be in a year or so. And with that, I'm going to bring you home. Okay? So I need and want you to define your superpowers. I want you to hack those hypotheses. There's only two people in the room that have a personal board of actors. Mike, do you have one? Dude, get on it. <laughs> but just not me. <laughs> um, and then I would encourage some risk taking in your career. And it can start a small risk. You know, the side project, just having coffee with the person that's a videographer, because you imagine a, a career in videography. Or you have a, a lunch with a photographer, because that's what you really want to be. That's Sam Watson, he's available for for adventure action. He wants to, uh, he's your best ski buddy. <laughs> um, anyways, <laughs> anyways uh, with that, I, I have time for all of your questions. So thank you very much. over the last 25 years of my career, and I didn't, okay? So I have consciously asked myself, what is my current job satisfaction on a zero to 10? I didn't have the, the, the I didn't report it. Um, but I have been consistent, a lot, you know, if, if, honest to God, if I went for six months at, 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 at a five job stack, that's when I was starting to look around for other jobs. You know, it's usually the bad boss, or you can tell the company's going to run out of money, or or your wife's giving you grief because you're not doing enough good for the world. Okay, uh, but I found it interesting when I graphed all of it. I saw lots of uh, themes that I that certainly were helpful to me looking forward, and I did use that insight in the last three years of my career. Yes. Yeah. So I was thinking, okay, how do I form my my board of directors? And I, there's some people I have in mind actually. And I'm like, okay. How do you actually mechanically organize that? I imagine that lunches that you take to lunch and talk about things. Do you, do you formally let them know? Do you ever actually have board meetings where you get all together and do stuff? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how the heck do I build this board, uh, personal board of directors that's comprised of both peers and mentors? So I'm, the, the, the hard part is mentoring. Um, so my first little thing is 
it's awkward if you ask them to be your mentor. Okay? This happens to me pretty often, and the way I hear it is, is you're an old person. <laughs> uh, so the better way is, this is uh, John Liu, he said, hey Gib, I'm interested in going from data to product, it'd be great if I could have lunch with you. Um, and we did that. Uh, and actually I, I liked him. We had a good personality fit. And then I, consciously or unconsciously, I have various tests, like, hey John, set us up for lunch a month from now. And that's actually hard with me to get on my calendar. Um, but he did it, and everything he, he, I asked him to do, he did it. Um, and then the trick part, part is you can all create value for your potential mentors. So John, uh, it was a, you know, it was a Friday, I said, hey John, if you want to be a product person, be a product person. Go build something. And he said, I don't know how to build anything. I said, have you ever heard of Squarespace? He said, no. I said, okay, go home this weekend, find Squarespace, and then build a website for me. And, and he did. So this, you know, if you go to www.gibsonbiddle.com, uh, it's what John, he created a lot of value for me. And you can tell, I, I love him dearly. Michael Sparks is in New York City. Um, I said, hey Michael, I'm, I'm coming to New York City. Tell me what the, the coolest meetups are to talk at. And he went to six of them. And he came back and said, this, these are the cool meetups, and here's the organizers, and here's who to play. So the, the key tricky part is mentors. Um, so tr treat them like normal people. And at the end of the day, see if you can create value for them. Uh, and usually you can. There's a, there's a lot of people who are incredibly helpful for me. Uh, on, on the peer side, it's just discipline. It's just being good about um, when you meet people, inviting them to connect on LinkedIn. It's uh, if you visit a different town, say, Ty Hatch, are you here? Yeah. Yeah. I sent an email. Ty, Tim, come. He's here. He's our sketch noter dude, right? Ty was one of two men at the Women in Product Conference. In, in, there were a thousand women in Ty. 1,500. 1,500. Uh, but you'll see some of his work. So he and I have gotten to know each other over time. Uh, I consider him up here. Uh, and he gives me the dirt on Salt Lake City. He says, these are the people you need to talk to, etc. It's, it's fun and it's easy. Unless you're an introvert. And then you just have to freaking do it. <laughs> other questions? Yeah. You said you're an assistant product owner and you want to be an assistant product owner in a different company? Oh, okay. There's lots of good news there. Um, so you're already showing that you could do the job, correct? I'm guessing that other company is quite different. Is that correct? That, that's the hard part about this transition? Yeah. Uh, okay, the way I approach it is. Um, Um, let's just, I'm going to keep it simple. Let's imagine I'm wicked excited about doing voice. I want to be part of the Alexa voice team. Um, so I, I get on LinkedIn and start uh, nicely reminding myself of all my Amazon pals. And then I start having conversations, lunch, coffee with them. I'm beginning to learn a lot about voice along the way. And then I finally triangulate to the voice people. Or I could talk to the Google voice people, but I'm learning as much as I can about the new area of expertise that I need to develop. And people, if you ask them, I find them to be sort of wonderfully giving all the time. I guess one of my insights is I'm the beginner's mind thing. I'm also really good at asking for help in a, in a non-shy way, uh, which I, frankly I find most people are afraid to ask for help. Uh, but in that case, if I was trying to triangulate to voice, I'm like, okay, who are all the people that? Um, are, are either friends or friends of a friend that'll help get me smart about voice. And by the time I'm in front of the Alexa voice people, I'm pretty smart because um, I've gone up learning her. And they love it because you, you probably learn some stuff they don't know because they're just in their job. Uh, but you were talking to the Google voice person, you learned a bunch of secrets and now you're passing it over. Um, it's very fun. Other questions? Yes. Uh, thinking about the superpower idea, I noticed you were kind of listed or you said you should have two or three or as strong as are like an optimal number can you, can you be really strong at one or how balanced do you want to be versus on that large list or versus just having you know, one or two yeah the question was on the, the list of superpowers on the technical skills of a product manager functional leadership skills is it good to have one or two or two or three 
my answer will be unsatisfying. Um, there's probably no, no real rule. Um, I think the helpful thing is if you can demonstrate real passion or real skills in at least one area, um, so people know how to think about you, and then they know where you might be a great fit. Like, for me, at some point in my career, uh, a lot of the companies that approached me, they had like open fighting between people in product and people in marketing. Like, the product people would say, you know, you turkeys in marketing, you're not doing enough to promote the product. And the marketing people would say, you turkeys in product, you're not building the right thing. Uh, and people would come to me because they knew that I was really strong on how to package and position product and, and, and build against it. So that one superpower sort of opened up a lot of doors for me. And then I was unabashed about a few of my weaknesses, which I've been unabashed about here today. So maybe maybe the answer is if you have one that's really demonstrable or really shows your passion <coughs> and what makes you wonderfully unique and different. And the, the harder side is like today if you're not into consumer science or better living through data, um, it's probably hard to be a product leader. Um, so you gotta have a you know a, at least you know B minus level skills in that area today. Yes? What do you think is most important? Soft skills or hard skills? I think I'm supposed to reject the question. <laughs> That's the way the debaters handle that. Um, it's a false construct. Um, let's see. Well, personally, I'm stronger on the soft skills. So a lot of my consumer insight is derived <laughs> through qualitative, which is like in a Netflix environment, which is all about the A-B testing, that was different. Uh, and then I have the soft skills on the management side and the communication skills. So that's what works for me. Uh, John Chikuti is one of my engineering partners. He's hard skills, he's a massive coder. He's whip smart about designing, executing, and analyzing A-B tests. That's what works for him. I think the only thing is be self-aware of who you are and don't try, don't try to sell yourself to someone you're not. Um, and the main thing there is if I wasn't really interested or passionate about a set of skills, uh, it probably wasn't going to happen. You know, I developed a real grit in the areas that I was really intrigued, you know, where I was doing hypercar resumes and my second year of business school. It's true. Uh, this is a, a job hunting story. I built a hypercar resume in 1991. And my wife's like, by the way, that only took me four months. And my wife's like, uh, why don't you do what normal people do, Give and put it on a piece of paper? <laughs> but it got me the job for my drawing card, which is cool. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Um, when you're building out a product team, are there particular skills you're looking for, that your weaknesses, or they, how do you look at that? That's a great question. Uh, the question was, when you're building out a team of product people, think of it as multiple product leaders on multiple pods or swim lanes. What do you look for? Um, it's funny, I, I actually asked this question uh, in a podcast of Todd Yellen, who, who, who runs product for Netflix. And it was really in the context of portfolio. He has a portfolio of people, okay? Uh, at Netflix, I did hire two creative wild ducks. Um, I hired a person with merchandising skills. I hired a person that came out of customer service and support. So I, I was experimenting a bit. Actually, the hardest one for me was when we started doing TV-based design. There really wasn't, there weren't many people out there who could do that. Um, so I found someone with, anyway, so I guess this, I mean, this, this is these people. You interview people, you think they're good at this, and then you discover something slightly different. And I was sort of experimenting with the right people and the right goals over time. I think the portfolio was helpful. On your question, did I, I, yeah, maybe maybe I hired the, the, the creative wild ducks because I I was a, I was a little afraid that I was underserving in that area. I needed more wild and wacky ideas. Actually, at Netflix, I spent a year finding someone with domain expertise in movies. They had just done their first film, and I was like, okay, you just did your first film. I know that that doesn't pay. How do you how do you put food on the table? And his answer was, I'm I'm coaching people on how to do better on the SATs. I'm like, ah, this is interesting. I'm sure he has some analytical skills and maybe he'll fit. 
And that's the dude that's now running product at Netflix. So you worked out nicely. Other questions? Uh, I, I'll get to you in a second. Yes. Uh, you mentioned on your board of directors, a common skill was extraordinary judgment. How do you recognize that in other people? And how do you cultivate that in yourself? Yeah. Okay. The question is, uh, how, how do you find uh, mentors with extraordinary judgment, and how do you cultivate in yourself? Okay. So the uh, it's not that hard on the mentors. Like Barry was the CFO at Netflix that worked out, and now he's the CFO at at, at Spotify. I'm hoping that will work out. Okay. So he's had neat success in his career, and that was targeted because I I needed somebody because I'm to think more about the, the investment opportunity, because I, I really don't think that way. Um, Patty, as extraordinary judgment, she, you know, she ran HR at Netflix, uh, so I'm looking at the results. In terms of uh, breeding extraordinary judgment in yourself, that idea that I talked about, I call it high business maturity, making good decisions about people and product and the business. I think a lot of it is just being conscious of what do I want to learn this next year. Uh, I certainly learned a lot through the consumer science, the A-B testing at Netflix. You know, that, that taught me a lot about the product. Uh, I, was, I was learning by doing. But I, I guess the, the first idea is be conscious of what you want to learn next year. that will help you get better at stuff. Yes? So uh, you have come from like an engineering background, so going back to the discussion about skills, is that, do you, do you regret, like, you know, not investing more of that? Uh, was that inhibited in your career, or do you think it's as long as you, you know, focus on your other? Um, yeah. So the question was, hey, Gib, today most product managers are required to have uh, substantially better technical skills than you have, and you are not a computer science major, you, would, you are an English major. Do I regret that? Uh, I'm certainly encouraging um, both of my daughters to, to, to do as met, much math and science as they can. Um, I, I don't regret it. I mean, so when I came to, uh, so I was interviewed for a product role at Yahoo, and they said, Give, you don't have enough technical skills. I said, okay, I understand. And then I went over to Netflix, and, and it, we were down the path, and I sort of stopped them, and I said, hey, I just want to make sure you understand I'm not a computer science person. I'm going to be the one English major in a building with 100 engineers. And they said, that's right. That's what we're looking for something different. So that worked out. Google calls me every five years and says, hey, you, we, we think we have a really neat role for you. And I say, I know you, 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 well, you, you you need me to have more computer science skills than I have, more technical skills. No, 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 we're looking for something different. So then I go interview for a day or two, and they say, oh, we're sorry, you don't have enough technical skills. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so in some way, you just have to be who you are. Um, I, I wasn't brain dead stupid. I, I did take Pascal and basic in high school and college. See, I dated myself again, and I, I used hypercard. Okay. Um, but I can, I don't let my eyes gloss over when I'm talking to engineers. And, I'm, and they like working with me because I'm good on the figuring out what's important, what's not, figuring out the long term strategy and how to succeed. That's a good thing. Yeah. How do you uh, maintain an aggressive career path, but also uh, find the right amount of satisfaction with your family and yes. that personal life? Okay. This is uh, how, how do you be aggressive in your career and also have satisfaction from family, etc. Uh, Mike is laughing at me. Um, okay, and this is essentially the life-work balance question. Um, so I'll tell you what my approach has been. Um, for the first probably 13 or 14 years of my career, I would leave a company on a Friday and start on a Monday. And then uh, we sold a company called I actually sold Family Wonder to Sega Japan. And at that moment, I said, I'm not going to answer the phone for a year. So I did a substantial um, sabbatical, uh, which was scary for me. I walked downtown in Burlingame. I'm like, what are all these people doing out here? I mean, I honestly thought that everybody is at work all the time. Uh, and that was a great year. And to your point, I was the dad. I was at school twice a week tutoring math builders. Um, my wife gave me the, uh, 
different call it the honeydew list, I mean the life maintenance list I had to do. It was a fantastic year for me. Um, today, think about my hacking in the last three years. I, I said I am only going to work three days a week, so I have time for these other things. Um, so I've just gotten conscious, and I'm also conscious I can't do it all. Um, but those were two different tactics that work for me. Uh, I'm also, I don't know why Mike's laughing, maybe he'll tell us in a minute. Um, we have a two-career household. So um, there were times where I was working like crazy, and she got to take a little time off, and then we flip, and it let us take on more risk as sort of a household. And then we have a, we had a nanny now for 22 years, and despite the fact that our kids are not in our house. Um, so that was a high quality of life thing for us as well. Okay, Mike, what were you laughing about? Yeah, how much? How many posts we have to endure of you out having fun? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, it, you can't do it all. I, I think the thing I've learned is be conscious about what I'm really trying to do, whether I'm trying to be uh, good for the community and the schools and for my daughters, or if it's a two-year period where I think if I work extra hard, I can move the career ahead. Um, you know, to, for me now, it's largely about teaching. I love teaching at Stanford, and I'll be teaching at Dartmouth, and, and I'm at a place where I don't have to worry as much about paying the mortgage, et cetera. So. That's, I don't know how to function in good luck, but I had some good luck along the way, which is good. Yes? The period where you were unemployed. Yes. It seems like for a lot of people that uh, something turned out as well as going to Netflix. Yeah. How did that happen? Yep. Okay. So the question was, uh, you were unemployed for a long time and then you freaking landed at Netflix. That doesn't sound too bad. Okay. Uh, how did it happen? Um, what, so that first year that I was not answering phone calls, um, that was conscious. And then at the beginning of the second year, I started looking around, and my peers said, hey, Gib, I don't think you're ready to work yet. I wasn't really scrolling my shoulder into it. Um, and so it was probably 18, 24 months in that I started to be aggressive. I just did the things that I said. Um, so I had my two conversations a day. I was patient. Um, and then I took care of myself, which is to say, if I had 90 minutes of exercise in the morning, that kept my mental health and sanity. Uh, I engaged in side projects, so uh, I, I, I helped startups on the side just to show that I still have skills, and it kept me busy, and it fulfilled my social needs. Um, but I, I was just very disciplined in my job search, and I was patient, and then I was lucky. That's the short answer. <coughs> Yes. Yes. Oh, thank yes. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, how do you think about what opportunities to say yes to? Is this like a new job opportunity? Could be a new job opportunity. Could be mentoring people. Could be talking, speaking in different places. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so uh, uh, the way I go through that now is if my purpose is to coach and teach and mentor then I'm trying to say yes to more of that stuff. I'm trying to do it in a leveraged way. So leverage is give a talk. Leverage is write an article. Um, and my next area of leverage is podcasts. And those are all creative outlets for me. So they're very consistent, consistent with my current goals and purpose. Uh, stuff I say no to, I don't do that very well. I don't do it enough. Um, I mean, my hardest thing right now is there's probably 10 people that I'm engaged with that are trying to figure out how to find their next great job. And I haven't found a way to, to do that in a leveraged way as yet. And it's hard because they have an expectation that I will be helpful, um, but I don't think they understand how hard it is for me to be helpful to 10 people in parallel. So that's hard for me. You have people coming over. I love Utah, just by the way, so it's not very hard to get me here, uh, but I'm waiting for the snow. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks for all the individual career advice to all of us. The question is, what's your advice to us in the community in Utah to keep up giving your work? Uh, so, now I'm, I'm remembering you from Chag now, Raymond. Um, yeah, very, yeah, so yeah, yeah. very exceptional. <laughs> the advice? 
What is my advice to you? Well, this this community, this is the digital this community, Utah. Yeah. People like to call it Silicon Slope. I don't like that term. Okay. Because go down to a hydro the lake. That's that's my personal thing. Yeah. But how do we, as a community, keep up events? I see. Okay. The question is, how do we, as a community, keep up, stay engaged? Events is the idea. How do you make? This area an increasingly strong area of innovation. Is that the question? Oh, well, the good news is you've got you got a nice vector going. You've got schools. You've got a great place for people to live, and you've got uh, a lot of things that make it affordable. Um, so I would say so far so good. Uh, and then as a community, you have focus. It feels to me very enterprise software focus here, and that's you know having a focus is super important and helpful. And then you've got you know young bright people graduating from school who are willing to take on risk. Um, so I see lots of good stuff, and frankly, it feels like a vibrant community to me. Like there's lots of um, uh, organizations that are getting people together on a monthly basis. Um, Brandon, among one of those organizers. Hat tip to Brandon. Um, so I, to me, it, it it looks good and feels good. That's one of the reasons I love coming here. Okay, I'm gonna take the last question from the gentleman in the orange jacket whose name is Russell. Russell, how can I help you, Russell? Uh, so, um, I'm trying to, so you were at Netflix. Um, I just kind of have to find it hard to understand why we leave a, a company at such a good stage. Yet you said yeah, it's getting too big, and your wife, but you realize that you can help the world more. Um, <laughs> but why do you really like your wife? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, why would you leave Netflix? Um, <laughs> what's wrong with big companies, Gibson? Um, okay. So the first thing is, there's no way. So I was the right person to take that company from one million members to fifty million members. So when I joined, the average tenure in my role was six months. Why would I want that job? And, and I spent a lot of time understanding. And what was going on was they had an exceptional team of starters that wasn't embracing the consumer science and the better living through A-B testing. And that was what the CEO was looking for. Uh, and I had the good fortune to take statistics at business school and I could sort of fake my way through the conversation. Um, so for those five years, I built the right team to scale. Uh, I built the consumer science processes. And there was no way that I was going to be the right person for the next five years. So the, the, the folks that are in my role now are PhDs in statistics. You know, they're wicked smart about machine learning. And, and I talk about myself as being a builder. There's something after that that... It, it, so the other thing is the job's not as fun. So I was responsible for the website, the mobile devices, and for all these TV-based systems. Uh, and today, those are three or four different jobs. So then, go to check. So check was doing good for the world, and honest to God, my wife says stuff like this to me, like, you know, are you really spending your time on the most important things? And frankly, I got to take a break. So I got, that was one of my awesome winters out here, where I, January, February, March, I was skiing all the time, and then I started checking in April. Uh, so short answer, um, keenly aware that I wasn't gonna be the right person, to take it from 15 million numbers to 100 million numbers. Uh, and then if you look at, if you look carefully at Netflix, at this point, after 20 years, they had four different management teams, all at these different stages. What are the today? It's like HBO. You know, they're making bets on original content. It's very different. Um, now the good news is Reed Hastings. He's the CEO. He's been the CEO the whole time. But that's the only person that's been consistent over those 20 years. Cool. All right, I'm going to hang out here. Thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you, Brandon, for having me. Thank you, uh, Pat Archive. Thanks, Sam Watson. Thanks, Ty Hatch. I'm looking forward to seeing your work. So, uh, so neat to be here. And I'm going to hover around and have to answer questions for as many hours as you want. <laughs>